Hi, I'm Lisa Saunders. Welcome to Pack B TV. And I'm really super excited because it's the first time I've interviewed two people at once on Zoom. And they are two very special ladies who came here to talk about the leading viral cause of birth defects, which is congenital cytomegalovirus or CMV. Thank you so much for coming on. Angela, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Angela Cote from Buffalo, New York, and my daughter was born with congenital CMV. And what does that mean as far as birth defects? So um, it can cause an array of birth defects. Uh, my daughter has severe hearing loss. It's the actual number one cause of hearing loss. And um, there's I many other... Non, number one non-genetic cause of hearing loss. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brandy, how about you? Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Brandy Herdebees. I'm also from Buffalo, New York. And my daughter, Samantha, was born congenital CMV. Now, I'm a little surprised you're both from Buffalo and you keep hearing uh, how what a rare virus it is. What are the chances of two moms in Buffalo? And I think there's even a lot more, isn't there? Aren't there? There's a lot more moms in Buffalo, New York. They have congenital CMV. I have uh, a child with congenital CMV. I have a friend who lives three blocks away, not, you know, who had a daughter born with congenital CMV. We only know each other because of our daughters, but there's tons of us in Buffalo. And all over the country, actually, because it is the leading viral cause of birth defects. In fact, the CDC says one out of 200 babies is born with congenital CMV. Now, only one out of five of those will have permanent disabilities. Brandy, what are your daughter's disabilities, if you don't mind? Of course. My daughter, Samantha, has spastic quad cerebral palsy. Uh, she has hearing loss in both of her ears. She is considered legally blind. She has microcephaly. Uh, she has epilepsy, and she depends on a G-tube for all of her nutritional needs. Um, Angela, did you have, uh, what happened now, Angela, you found out your daughter was born with congenital CMV because there was a law passed in 2018 requiring, in New York, requiring that if a child passed their hearing test, which all newborns in New York have to have, then they're tested for CMV. Is that right? Yeah, so um, my daughter went for her hearing test, as you know most no newborns do, and she failed on the one side, which is typical with C-sections. Um, it was kind of brushed off a little bit, um, but because of this new bill that was passed, um, she had to be tested for CMV, and the nurse just came in and said, we just have to you know, attach a little bag to her diaper. They're going to test her urine. I'm sure it's going to come back negative. You know, All your ultrasounds and blood work look great. And um, we've had a lot of people test it and it's, you know, um, very rare and um, it was not so rare. It, it came back positive um, a couple of days later. And what did you do then? Be having that information, what did that allow you to do or, you know? Well, um, unfortunately, I'd never heard of CMV before. So um, it was kind of shocking when uh, I started to look it up because the nurse didn't really give me any information and just kind of told me not to look it up or Google it. And well, when someone tells you not to do something, it kind of <laughs> triggers you to do it. So uh, when I looked it up, it, it was very scary to know one that I've never heard of it before, especially because I had a toddler at home and I've been a nanny and worked around kids and it's prominent in daycares and younger children. Um, so when we found out that it was positive, you don't really know what to expect with your child because they're a newborn, but I mean, it can cause many disabilities. So um, for my daughter, we are very blessed and we are a rare case of it. She only right now has severe hearing loss, but with CMV, it can kind of go at any time. So it's just something that we're on top of and she has hearing tests every six months. Okay. So that's what you do is you follow her hearing to make sure that she's getting enough amplification. Does she have uh, hearing aids or anything like that? Yes. So right now she has a Baja, but um, being a two-year-old, uh, she's not really fond of wearing it. She likes to take it off her head. And um, so she doesn't wear it too much, but we are working on trying to get it. Um, but she does really well with her speech right now. She does speech once a week and okay. she, she's doing really well for speaking. You know, she loves singing and and dancing. So, uh, so luckily we... you caught this hearing loss and have been monitoring it. And Brandy, what happened to you? Like what what was your journey of finding out about this virus? Uh, at my 18 week ultrasound, uh, while I was still pregnant with my daughter, they noticed an echogenic ball, uh, which can be a sign that there is a viral infection. 
Um, I was referred to two specialists and I was followed very closely throughout my pregnancy. Lots of ultrasounds, lots of blood work. Um, in the, before I gave birth to my daughter, they told me, uh, I mean, throughout the entire pregnancy, I was told that CMV was rare, uh, that it was not CMV. Even if it was CMV, the worst thing that was going to happen was that she would lose her hearing. And basically before I had her, they kind of said, it's not CMV and we don't know what it is. Um, and then she was born. And as soon as she was born, everyone kept on saying the word microcephaly, which is a small head. Um, and she had petechiae all over her body. Um, when she was handed to me, her neck was floppy. I would find out later that was because of um, low tone in her neck. And um, it didn't take long after the pediatricians examined her. She had a an, uh, enlarged liver and spleen. She was very jaundiced. And they were saying CMV right away. Um, even before they had the blood work back, they were saying it's CMV. And I just did not believe them because I was told so many times it wasn't CMV and that CMV was rare. Yeah, and it's not so rare. And um, according to the CDC, a lot of people can contract it uh, from toddlers because they're otherwise healthy, but it's a virus that they can excrete because they catch it from each other because they're slobbering on each other's toys and stuff. So it is something that toddlers can be excreting in their urine and saliva. So um, what is your hope education-wise for, for women? I hope that women learn to, first of all, talk about CMV with their doctors and to push back if a doctor tells you that it's rare because it's not rare. And I wish I had pushed back and I wish I had research, but I just took that as a reassuring thing that my baby's going to be okay. Um, I had a toddler at home who was in daycare. I was sharing food with him. I was sharing my water bottle with him. I was kissing on his mouth. And there were plenty of times that I changed his diaper and I didn't wash my hands afterwards. Um, and I just want women to know that they need to use separate silverware than their children. Don't share food, don't share water, even though it feels so natural to do it with your right. own You can't do that when you're pregnant. You have to protect your unborn baby. Now, they are working on a vaccine for it, but the vaccine isn't available yet. So we really need the knowledge vaccine for CMV. Um, yeah, so I'm hoping that women will look it up that are watching this show uh, and their husbands or partners, whatever, will look up CMV so they can look at all the prevention tips. And you can find a lot of preven prevention tips on the National CMV Foundation web page, website, um, and at the CDC. And even New York has, uh, and Connecticut have put on training videos for daycare workers. Um, there, and if you look on YouTube, there's even nice little videos about what moms to be need to know about CMV. So um, yeah, I'm hoping people learn about it and realize it's kind of hard to prevent it totally if you have a toddler, but you can, uh, according to studies, right, they've, that they've done, you can reduce your chances of contracting it if you know about it. Um, I would have loved to have just known, just known. Right. And when I yes. My, uh, I mean, especially knowing that I was a nanny and I had a toddler at home. I mean, you were told when you're pregnant that you shouldn't touch, um, kitty litter, that you shouldn't eat deli meat, that you um, should not have hot dogs. I mean, there's, there's so many things that they just, you know, mention, and it would just be nice to say, you know, there is a virus and just to be careful, especially if you have a kid at home or you work in daycares, make sure you're washing your hands. Hand hygiene is so important. And I just would have loved to have known about it and not known, you know, when the doctor was coming me back, telling me that she tested positive and, not knowing what our future was going to hold with her. That, so how do you keep yourself sane worrying about the future? Or do you try not to worry about tomorrow and just take care of today? Do you have any tips for moms with children with disabilities? Either of I, you? I think that it's inevitable, inevitable, excuse me, that you're going to worry about the future. Uh, my daughter can't walk. My daughter can't talk. She's going to always need me. I worry about the fact that I will either outlive her because I've seen so many CMV children pass. And I worry about what happens when um, she outlives me and who's going to take care of her. But 
you can't spend too much time wrapped up in that. Your mind's going to wander, of course. Um, but you just have to enjoy every day. I hate what happened to her, but she is amazing. They sound like, they sound amazing. I've seen pictures of them and we're going to show pictures of them um, in this video. And thank you so much for sharing the story because you can't prevent it now. Nobody gave you the information to help reduce your chances of contracting it. But thank you so much that you're trying to get the information out there to prevent other children from being born with congenital CMV. And what do you think women need to do? Do you think they just all women should just be going to maybe the CDC website to look at viral causes of birth defects? Or what do you think women should do? I think more? that it's just important to ask questions. Um, I even have recently started putting um, a bunch of stuff on my Instagram and Facebook because I just want people to be aware of it. I just want them to know about it. I want them to know that there's a virus that can cause some very devastating effects to their unborn baby. And, you know, knowledge is power. So if you know, then you can take the proper precautions. And like Brandy said, you, you can't, when we were given this diagnosis, you can't change it like this is for life. And while we on the, our very opposite end of Samantha, we are one advocate for all of them so that, you know, they're not having this for nothing. Like we want to raise awareness. And I think it's just important to ask the questions, look at the CDC website. You know, if you know someone, you'll feel free to reach out to either one of us. We'd love to answer anyone's question. Now, how um, could they find you to reach out to you? Is there a website they could go to or... Yes, you can always reach out to me on my Facebook. I'm Angela Perino Cote on Facebook or I'm Angela Cote on um, Instagram. Um, I would love for anyone who has any questions or if you do have, you know, a baby with CMV, I'd love to connect with anybody that um, in the area or in the world really that um, has it. There's also the CMV Foundation's website, which I find has the most accessible information about CMV. And um, I wish I had had that resource when I, or I had known about the resource when I was pregnant with Samantha, because I feel like there are just so many things that lists off that are great topics to bring up with your doc or doctor and great things to ask to be tested for. Um, so you understand when you were exposed to ZMV, if you were. And I'm right there with Angela. Um, my Instagram is public. I'm uh, at strong like a mama on Instagram and on Facebook, I'm Brandy Herdebees. And Angela and I have connected with so many CMB moms in Western New York, and we'd love to connect with more. That's just so wonderful that despite, you know, having challenges, because you're obviously, it's a lot more work to take care of children. You know, children are hard enough to take care of. <laughs> and you have ones with special needs that you're going out there trying to prevent this from happening to others so that their, what happened to them doesn't, isn't in vain, you know, that you're able to share that information. Um, it's kind of hard when you trust them, you know, that somebody is giving you all the information you need, but we all have to be advocates for ourselves, <laughs> for our unborn think, children. Yeah, yes. doctors don't know everything, you know, and that's, o that's okay, but they don't know everything and you have to be your own advocate. And I would, what happened to Samantha shouldn't happen to another baby or another child, but it has. I know so many moms, we all do, um, who have children with CMV and it needs to stop happening. Now, I, it's important to note um, that some people might be afraid, like, oh, no, there's a child with diagnosed congenital CMV in my class. And what they need to know is, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, you shouldn't exclude them because up to 75% of children are excreting the virus off and on for years. So this is important for all your teachers, yes. your, your daughter's teachers to know that is and that. I think I'm, that Angela and I were both told to keep our baby separate from other um, people and from other moms and pregnant women um, for at least the first six months of their life and not really given a lot of background on that. So we just had to tell everybody stay away from my baby. <laughs> and I found out later that, I mean, unless they were staying away from other children, they didn't need to stay away from my daughter. 
So right, right from the get-go, she was excluded. They were both were. Right, because it's it's so prevalent. That's what women need to know. It's so prevalent that they really should not be kissing their toddlers on the mouth or sharing drinks with them. I, you know, and we know a lot of moms don't know that. I, I watch moms, exhausted moms, their toddler runs up, take a, takes a sip from their cup, and the moms keep drinking from their own same cup. And they even know the kind of awareness work a lot of us moms do. <laughs> and I'm thinking <laughs> it really needs to be drilled into everyone. Yes. The, you know, don't share the toothbrush. Don't share. I see moms, you know, the, the, the toddler drops the pacifier on the ground. The moms figure, okay, I'm just going to suck off the dirt with my mouth and give the toddler back their pacifier. Well, now you're getting your toddler <laughs> saliva. And people don't need to be terrified of one drop of saliva. Yeah. I've heard that it takes more of a viral load, like c consistently yeah. doing those kind of activities, you know, that are normal for moms and toddlers to do. But we just need, unfortunately, we need to help moms realize. <laughs> Certain yes. cultures don't do that, by the way. You know, they don't believe in kissing the toddlers on the mouth or sharing cups. So I think it depends on the culture. Sure. Well, thank you so much for coming on uh, the TV show. I really appreciate you sharing your information and your life. And I really believe that there's going to be some unborn, unborn children out there that won't know it, but your words have helped protect them and their future. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. It was a great uh, informational period and I'm so excited to be able to do this with you. Thanks again. This is great yeah, to connect. And it was wonderful to be here. Thank you. Bye-bye.